Virtual Coast Fest 2021 coming to you live from Georgia DNR's Coastal Regional Office in Brunswick. This is so cool. We are worldwide. Do you realize somebody might be watching in Caracas, Venezuela? I just like saying Caracas because I say it correctly. Anyway, so people are watching all over. The schools are watching today. Thank you so much for joining us. The elementary schools, the middle schools, the high schools. We thank you for your participation and we urge you to send us questions. So we'll talk more about that in just a little bit. I'm Joe Willie from 1041 The Wave, Golden Isles Broadcasting. I'll be your guest host today. And I'm excited to be here with Janie and Megan of DNR's Coastal Resources Division. Now, Janie, tell us a little bit about yourself. Sure, so my name is Janie Gaskin and I've been working on the coast of Georgia in conservation and biology for about 10 years now. Um, so I recently started with Coastal Resources Division in January of this year and I'm a wetlands field biologist. So my specialty here is marsh health and monitoring. All right, Megan, tell us about yourself. I'm Megan Angelina. I'm also a wetlands biologist here at the Coastal Resources Division. I got my start here as a Sea Grant State Fellow. Um, I started in September 2020 and I started in this position last month. So my specialty is looking at living shorelines and wetlands research, monitoring, and policy work. Well, thank you so much for taking time out of your day to be with us. Now, y'all have prepared a video for us, is that right? Yes. Mm -hmm. well, let's take a look at it. All right. Home to more than 368,000 acres of protected marshlands. These marshes provide habitat for a variety of species from shrimp to egrets to terrapins. The marshes also protect people and property from the effects of damaging storms like hurricanes and nor'easters. When these storms pass through Georgia coast, they can alter shorelines, sometimes causing erosion. Erosion caused by strong currents and battering waves can lead to changes in the shape of shorelines. These changes may result in the loss of upland concerning property owners. In the past, people have used a variety of man-made structures to protect against erosion. Structures like bulkheads and rock revetments, also known as riffraff, have been placed in erosional areas to prevent property damage. But since 2006, some locations in Georgia have chosen a new, more environmentally friendly way to prevent erosion called living shorelines. Living shorelines provide an alternative to conventional armored shores like bulkheads and riffraff. They use bioengineering combined with native vegetation to stabilize or enhance wetland habitats. These nature-based structures are constructed by the placement of back oyster shell along the shoreline and by planting native plants in the intertidal and supertidal zone. Mesh netting and lining secures oyster bags to the bank. Because they mimic natural shorelines, they also provide upland and aquatic habitat for estuarine life, including the eastern oyster, which is a keystone species to the marshland ecosystem. so that fertilizers do not enter the water and runoff does not increase turbidity. Once these living shorelines are established, other live oysters found naturally in the ecosystem will attach to them and grow, further protecting the shoreline and supporting other marine life like shrimp, blue crab, and flounder. You may think that living shorelines might be more expensive than traditional erosion control methods, but in fact, they're equal to or less expensive than the cost of bulkheads and riffraff. With changes to our landscape caused by sea level rise, more and more coastal residents are opting for living shorelines to protect their property and provide essential habitat for marsh species. To learn more about living shorelines, please visit www.coastalgadnr.org. What a great video. Quick reminder, you can ask questions via Facebook and YouTube. Now, as we wait on some questions, we urge you to ask some questions to us. Uh, I'll get started. Can any other materials besides oyster shells be used for a living shoreline? So yes, there's a material called Fleximat that's currently being tested. This is kind of a concrete light block, like block. It's made of vegetative materials and you can lay a bunch of these on the shoreline. And we're hoping to see if it will recruit oysters. Um, we want to eliminate the need for oyster shell because it's expensive, it's well sought after. Um, so it's currently being used on two projects in Georgia right now. And it's a little early to tell, but it looks like it has potential for oyster recruitment success. 
So what's the most common buffer plant? So that's a great question because plants are a really important component of living shorelines. So if you think of the, the living shoreline as stabilizing an eroding bank, such as you see here in this model. So we have an eroding bank on this side where there's a lot of wave energy, things are being washed away. So here's an example of a living shoreline. So if you think of it in segments, there's part of it that is submerged by the tide multiple times a day. So in that area, we want to make sure to put some really salt tolerant plants because of the, the salinity of the water here on the coast. So then in the higher area, the buffer zone or the transient zone between the wetland zone and the upland, we want to make sure that we're putting plants that have really strong root mass that add to the structure um, of this buffer or transition zone. So muley grass is a really popular one. It's, it's native to Georgia salt marshes and it blooms in the fall and it's really beautiful. So hurricanes, we're all concerned about hurricanes. Do the marshes protect us from hurricanes? Yes, so our, our coastal marshes here on, in Georgia um, and on the coast actually do act as a natural buffer system against storms. So they absorb wave attenuation energy um, and they, they also act as a natural runoff system for storm surge water. What are the advantages of a living shoreline? So the advantages of a living shoreline are to mimic the structure of a natural shoreline as opposed to a hard structure, which is usually a more harsh and severe um, buffer or protectant of an upland area. Um, it also creates more access for animals between the wetland and the upland. And I'll, Megan, I'll let you add some, some yeah. points. So as Janie briefly mentioned, um, it acts as a buffer for storm runoff. So it can actually collect these contaminants before they make their way to the water. They are aesthetically pleasing and really enhance habitats for fishing and fisheries opportunity for recreation here in Georgia. I was watching the video, all those oysters, where do you get all those shells? <laughs> That's a really great question. So here at uh, DNR at Coastal Resources Division, we actually have a shell recycling program and it's really exciting. We have a new drop off here at the Coastal Regional Headquarters at One Conservation Way in Brunswick, Georgia, where people who have oyster roasts can drop off their shell. However, this shell is used specifically to create more fish and oyster habitat in Georgia Creek. So we don't use that shell for living shorelines. We're using that to create more recreational fishing opportunities. So the living shoreline shell, because we need so much of it, because these projects are usually fairly large, we usually purchase shell from other states. We've purchased shell from Florida, South Carolina, North Carolina, and Alabama before. What state has the best oyster? Now, I don't know if I'm allowed Oyster to say shells. that. Oyster shells. <laughs> Oyster shells. I would say, I, well, you know, I'm a native Georgian, so of course I'm going right. to be biased and say we have the best shell. <laughs> <laughs> How do you bag these oysters? the oyster shells? Yeah, so it depends on the size or the specific project that's going on, but it's an assembly line process. So we have a bagging machine and these shells are loaded onto the bagging machine and we have a lot of different biologists, volunteers working together and different partners. Um, people get the shell off of the machine. We can tie these knots in the side of the bags the bags will then be stacked and transported to their final destination. So in that process, I've got to ask this question, who's got the best job and who's got the worst job? Oh, goodness. So if I were a volunteer, which <laughs> job would I want to do in that bagging Let's process? See. Well, we, we had two of our interns, from uh, one from College of Coastal Georgia uh, here in Brunswick last year and one from Swanee bag oyster shells for a good bit of the summer and they seem to enjoy all parts of the they job. They like it all. Because you get to be outside on the coast, <laughs> uh, right? They, yeah. It's better than being in a classroom. <laughs> Definitely. Right. And they can go from one position to the next okay. and really change it up. How long does it take for oysters to establish themselves on a living shoreline? Okay, so baby oysters will be floating along in the water. They'll be trying to sense different structure, uh, usually made of calcium carbonates, like carbonate, like our shells or other uh, material in the water. And once they sense this, they can attach to it. Once the baby oysters attach, they're known as spat. And it takes about one to three years for oysters to become um, full-grown adults. And this range, it can be one year versus three years, depending on the temperature, salinity, or other conditions of the water. Um, Georgia has often been called spat rich and substrate poor. <laughs> <laughs> so we have the potential to have a lot of um, healthy oysters, but um, 
that kind of highlights the need for these shell recycling programs so that we can reuse the shell by putting it back into the ecosystem and giving these baby oysters a good opportunity to attach and it can create habitat for different fish and um, protect our shorelines as well. That is so cool. We're number two right now in the college poll for football, <laughs> but number one in the spat poll. <laughs> I like that. Who can install a living shoreline? Can anybody do that? Yeah, so anyone with an eroding tidal bank, like the one here in our diagram, can um, apply for an authorization through the Coastal Resources Division to construct a living shoreline. So this permitting process is in place to um, really make sure the appropriate materials are used for our living shorelines and make sure our oyster shells are clean and not introducing any kind of disease for our marine life and existing oysters in the water. All right. Can you harvest oysters from an established living shoreline? Great question. So no, you can't harvest oysters from an established living shoreline. So the purpose of a living shoreline is usually to protect a bank that's eroding and this usually is occurring in an area of development where people use the area. So it's usually not a recreational harvest area. The recreational harvest areas are designated in Georgia tidal creeks and those areas are monitored by biologists for water quality to ensure the oysters are nice and healthy. So that's where you want to stick to. So know where your oysters came from know before where you your buy oysters, them. Yep. Okay, especially out of the back of a, a trunk or something of a car. <laughs> Definitely. Okay, right. So the mesh nets, what are they made from? I was real curious yeah. about that. So here's our example right here and as you can see it's the this mesh holds these shells in place. It's made from polyethylene, which is a synthetic plastic. Um, and this is a miniature version, but typically these mesh pieces are cut into 36 inch uh, pieces. Are they biodegradable? So this plastic, because it's made of the synthetic plastic, it's not biodegradable, but the department is working with different companies to try to develop some kind of material that would be biodegradable so that we can use those um, in the future. So the fact that they're not going anywhere, it's not like they're floating off out in the ocean. Right. They're not going to be harmful to turtles, whales, or any other sea life. That's right. correct. These are completely isolated. Okay, so on we don't have to worry about that. Yes, they'll right. stay put and they're really trying to stabilize that shoreline and hold the sediment in place. Y'all have fascinating jobs. How did you get started <laughs> in this? That's a great question. So I actually grew up uh, along the Georgia coast. Uh, my family is from Effingham County, so I grew up kayaking and paddle boarding and swimming in the Savannah River and coming to vacation on Jekyll and Tybee, so I've always loved the coast. And I actually got my start in turtle conservation on St. Catharines Island with a program there through Georgia Southern University when I was getting my master's and just kind of stuck around with that and then I was really excited to see this opportunity with CRD as to expand my uh, my reach further along the coast and to not just see turtles in one island habitat but into the marsh habitat that supports a lot of different species. How did you get started? Yeah, so I recently graduated with my master's degree. I was, my degree is in fisheries biology, so I was heavily involved in fisheries research. But I always strive to bring the value of coastal and marine resources to different partners, the public, and so I really wanted to see the management and policy side of things, which led me to uh, my positions here at CRD and really looking into the habitat and working with different people and now I get to work in the habitats where these fish are that I used to study in the past. What a great, what a great career. Now you still have time to call, to not call us, I'm thinking radio. You can <laughs> get on YouTube or Facebook and ask us any question that you like for uh, Janie and Megan here this afternoon uh, about what they're talking about, the shorelines, uh, or any other DNR questions, I guess, if would be okay. Uh, so go ahead and do that. While we're waiting on some questions, I want to mention the artwork behind us. I want to thank the uh, kids at St. Francis Xavier School and also Needwood Middle School. As you see, some really nice artwork. The way that happens is every year there's an art contest at Coast Fest. Now, this year, because we had the pandemic roar back, we uh, decided, it was decided, to uh, hold off on having an art contest in the schools because at that time uh, the kids weren't in the schools. But anyway, a couple of the schools went ahead and did an art contest. And that was St. Francis, Xavier, and Needwood. So uh, there was so much great artwork that it was decided, you know what, let's use it on our 
uh, virtual Coast Fest today, and you'll be able to take a look at it. So that's pretty cool. I've got a question for y'all. In doing shoreline, in doing the uh, putting together the shorelines like this, uh, have you ever been chased by a gator? Has any gators come up, and you know, curious gators come up in these waters? So I have some experience in, in herpetology, working with sea turtles, and then obser observing animal behavior on St. Catharines because we end up sharing the island. And a lot of our, our marsh here and wetlands, like people on the mainland too will notice, you share habitat with other species that um, have been around for a really long time, like alligators. And I always try to emphasize the fact that if you respect them, they'll respect you. So have I ever been chased by an alligator? <laughs> no, I hope not. <laughs> we have not. Although I do have a funny story of yesterday. I was out in the field with uh, our colleague, uh, Colby, and she needed, to, uh, she needed to get off the boat to like rinse some mud off of her boots. And as soon as she got off the boat and got into the waist deep water, an alligator popped up right in front of our boat. And I was like, you know, <laughs> I, I think I'll, I'll wait until she's back in the boat to tell her. And I said, once she got back in, you're going to think this is really funny now, but there is an alligator up there. <laughs> Had you told her, that would have been a world record for getting back in a boat. Absolutely. People just have a tendency to do that for some reason. <laughs> All right, so that's going to be all the time we have for this session. I want to thank both uh, Janie and Megan for all the great information on the Living Shoreline. Uh, another quick question, wetlands. If it rains a lot in my yard, can I consider that wetlands or, <laughs> or not? Well, if you want us to come and monitor it, we certainly will. Okay, okay, you're on. <laughs> and lastly, thank you all for joining us this afternoon. Coast Fest, the virtual reality version. Uh, thank you so much. Hopefully next year. We'll be back at Mary Ross Waterfront Park and do it all in person. Thank you.